Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the Elise Wine Drinking Network. I am Christopher Lund, your host. I am Garrett Lyon, your co-host. Your other host. <laughs> uh, welcome, guys. Look, we're all kind of experimenting with this together, so part of what this whole thing is is an at-home wine drinking network. The whole point is we're still going to collect, we're still going to drink wine together. We've just kind of changed the rules of engagement. Uh, so today we thought the best way to get started was to jump in on friendly stuff. So we're going to talk Zinfandel today. And this is a grape that we can go as far deep down the rabbit hole of history with this grape as anything in the entire wine industry. And I think to some degree, and you might want to talk on this a little bit, but I don't know that Zinfandel has ever had the respect of the varietals I've ever gotten. Like Chardonnay, Pinot, Cabernet gets all this grand attention. And when you say the word Zinfandel, people kind of snicker a little bit, mm -hmm. man. You know, why is that? What is it with the grape? You're, you're a worldly man. Uh, that's a good question. Well, Cab is king, uh, probably in this world. Chardonnay is queen. And also, sometimes there's perceived value with pricing. So, because Zinfandel is such an amazingly well-priced variety, it just doesn't get the respect that it deserves. You know, it's funny because we talk about the word respect, and yet, historically, and this is where we're still playing around as a group of wine drinkers, Zinfandel goes back as far as anything. Sangiovese is thought to be a mother grape. It wasn't cultivated. It was one of the wild grapes that was actually growing. The theory is that Zinfandel was another one of those wild grapes that was actually a physical varietal that Mother Nature had come up with all on her own, and it grew in such wide varieties of areas that it became a popular grape because you could make a reliable wine from it. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to play with the fact that Zinfandel is uh, transportable, malleable. It grows in all appellations, from brighter versions on the coast to super intense versions from Paso Robles in the Central Valley to really serious single vineyard, some of the world's best wine. Like as a Californian, if I'm gonna put a foot forward internationally and brag about something, yeah, we make great Cabernet, and great Chardonnay, and great Pinot, and great Sauvignon Blanc. Those are worldly wines. Zin and Petit are all the grapes I walk in the room going, these are ours and nobody else gets to play with this. Very true. Um, and so from that standpoint, I think we swagger a little bit as Infandel drinkers and producers because that is our unique sort of California echo into this whole equation. Although, go figure, in America, where did Zinfandel get its start? Yeah, Boston. Yeah, let's think about the great Boston Zin vintages of the 1800s, <laughs> man, you know? Yeah, um, because uh, honestly, it was originally cultivated as a table grape. We were going to eat them like the, the, the Concords and the, the red seedless flames that we get today. Um, but of course, they discovered that Vitis vinifera grapes have a much different acidity profile. It wasn't good to eat a whole cluster of those and then try to move through your day. Um, so we're going to play today with, we've got the current release vintage of Zinfandels, we've got the 2014s, and we're going to play with the same grape Zinfandel, but from three different locations. And then we're going to touch on the echo of how a wine like Zinfandel will still continue to age for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, it's interesting as we've gone back through the libraries here at Elise that alcohol is the number one indication of some of the technology involved in wine making and that the old school wines are in the 12 to 13 percent range for the most part as we move forward through the 80s and 90s we started seeing 14 15 and then of course the i don't know if you want to call it the turley effect larry that's for you um <laughs> was now we're at 16 to 18 percent alcohol and these are dry wines um what was the what was the first thing you drank Great question. It was probably Ridge, Litton Springs, actually maybe even Ravenswood or Rosenblum. You kind of taught me about the three R's. Three R's, had them yeah. All. But yeah, there, it was delicious. It was easy on my palate, fruit forward, soft tannins. Um, and back in the day when I started drinking wine illegally in the mid to late 90s, <laughs> uh, really I thought the most bang for my buck was the wines that were 16 and a half percent. I think that's the word you'll always hear associated with Zinfandel's value. I think, right. I mean, my first guy, some of my first buys were the, the Segazio. That $15 Sonoma Zin was such a satisfier, you know, as a song, I put it on every wine list I ever operated because it was such a crowd pleaser. And I keep coming back to that as a varietal in general, is the crowd pleasing nature of it. Like, it's so funny how you can drink the world's great wines. You can really focus on lesser wines. Zin seems to satisfy both sides of that equation. Well, and I'm glad you brought up Segacio because I think Mr. Segacio is a Pete Segacio. Oh, yeah. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. Um, but he's one of the 
kind of founding fathers of Zinfandel in California, and I don't want to limit it to just a few people, but there's been a lot, and we're lucky enough to be pouring Ray Corson's wines, which is another one of the um, great ambassadors of California Zinfandel, and we're, we're fortunate enough to basically be pouring his wines and show how well-made Zinfandel oh, ages. I know one good way to find this whole equation out. You know, <laughs> let's get past the theory phase and go right to the three-dimensional phase, which is the actual drinking. And to those of you at home, cheers. Six okay. feet apart. <laughs> Are we supposed to air toast now? It's supposed to be like, eh, eh, I don't know Eye contact is really the most important yeah. thing in cheersing. Absolutely. Back in the day, a little fun fact, uh, the whole cheersing of touching glasses was back when people would poison or want to poison other leaders and so you would touch your glass and you clink them hard enough with the mead they used to drink to where some of your cup spills into the others and vice versa and that's the way you would know your so toasting you, is trust correct but now right. hopefully nobody's poisoning each other with wine um so we can just eye contact well, that's really funny you talk about that whole poisoning thing that's actually where the origins of sommelier as a profession came from the sommelier was actually his job before he became known as the sommelier. His job was, he was the, we talked, you read about this in stories. He was the king's food taster. That's what his job was. And, and so he would taste the king. I mean, what a weird job, right? You're the king's yeah. food taster. So if the king's kind of a prick, you know, you had a really dangerous job, man. You know, if he was like well-liked and well-adjusted, like you're the greatest job ever, man. But you had a tough decision to make if you were going to go work for the king and be his food taster, right? That's interesting because the same thing happened in Peru with potatoes and they would have the lower class taste the potatoes. And if they died, they knew that they weren't going to propagate, propagate that potato. So it's very similar. I mean, it's a food product. So the cart, the French product. word for the cart that you would load all the king's favorite food and beverages on, the cart was known as a somme. So your job became known as a sommelier to fill the king's cart with all the best food and beverage to satisfy the king. And that's where the historical nature of that comes from. Right? The knowledge, he just never ceases to <laughs> All right, so we got started today. And anybody that's at, at home right now that, is, that has had this in the past, this is the 2014, uh, this is the Cordy Ranch. Did I get that right? I'm not wearing my glasses. Uh, Zinfandel. Um, there are, again, such a wide variety of styles. And part of focusing on terroir is the fact that the site, when you're making sensitive, smaller production wine, the site is your champion. It is the thing that we always tell each other in the wine business is don't, don't walk around telling people we make the greatest wine in the world. Okay, we do, but that's not what, that's not what's <laughs> open for debate today. The whole thing about it is no one else in the world made it from those three acres. Like that is always the unique chip we will always have in this game, which is no one else made it from that site. So when you're making wine, I could easily take the Cordy Ranch, which is gorgeous, well-farmed, very sensitive family, but we could blend that into 100,000 cases and it could be the bouillon cube to take a lesser wine and make it greater. The fact that these families are willing to let us put their family names and, and some of their heritage on the bottle and let us singularly focus on their vineyard to make these wines, I think it's one of those great things about our business. And unless we keep drinking great Zinfandel, these families will tear it all out and plant other things. So it's really funny to think about the wine drinker being as important to this whole equation as the producer, as the grower, as the winemaker, as anybody else. Um, it's a it's a it's a collective uh, sort of uh, 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 process that we're all involved in. Yeah, it's a bit of co-branding, if you will. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. Was Heights Vineyards Heights Cellars in Napa one of the first to vineyard designate? I kind of feel like or Diamond Creek, but. Heights, it seems like, oh, Martha's talking, Vineyard and Bella Oaks. Yes, yes. Um, and Ray started doing it long ago, yes. and it's a reciprocity of Paul respect. Draper out there, I know you have the long-standing bet with <laughs> Joe Heights about... Who did it first? Montebello, or, uh, or you know, that or was Martha's. the original debate about who did the first vineyard designations. It's like um, John Daniels getting a hard time from other wineries by going, you bottled your own wine? That's going to cause problems for us, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um... There is an old reference to, I think it was 1976, was Chez Panisse. Okay, and here's another revolutionary out there in Alice Waters and going, I'm going to put farmers' names on my menu to celebrate the agricultural basis of some of her creations. 
And what's the first wine she served at her inaugural 1976 dinner was the Joseph Phelps 1976 Zinfandel. Uh, or she served, they, yeah, it was the 76 Zin they served, uh, or 74 Zin they served at the 76 dinner. But it was this whole gold rush vineyard. Anytime we think we're going to innovate something, we, we used to be able to talk to Joe Phelps and he'd be like, well, 20 years ago when we did that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nine years. And so as early on for a high profile restaurant like hers, and she wanted to serve a local wine of high quality, her first choice was Zinfandel. I thought that was interesting. I think that is interesting, but it makes sense because it's such a food friendly wine. Zinfandel, the, grit, the skins are thinner, not as, skin as pe not as thin as Pinot Noir, but they're thin skin, so it's not gonna carry as much of that phenolic tannin uh, that you'll get from Cabernet Sauvignon or Petite Zara or other higher tannic wines. So you're a little bit more free to uh, experiment with Pairings. Yeah, well, we can struggle to try to differentiate Pinot from different regions or Chardonnay. Zinfandel carries a lot of terroir with it. Like, I can taste the Zin and go, that is definitely Passeroles, and that is definitely Sonoma. That is definitely that. Yeah, it carries a lot of that with it. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping, you know, as a wine drinking public, that you continue to drink Zinfandel. I think that's one of the tough things about making wine sometimes, is as popularity ebbs and flows and everybody discovers new things that they want to drink, Growers have to respond to that, so sometimes the, the, the option to tear out some of that Zinfandel and plant things that they think are more popular, um, I'm not going to use the words Merlot, uh, and how that can backfire on you sometimes <laughs> instead of trying to chase popularity, just be brave enough to make the wine that you want to make in the strongest way uh, with your own integrity and let your wine drinker kind of catch up to you sometimes. Don't necessarily try to respond to trends. Uh, it's just like being a good chef and challenging your diner sometimes. Um, i got to tell you, it's, it's funny the way certain wines yeah, have certain moods, and so every given day when we're pouring wine, you start to kind of gauge the mood of your wine. So we might switch an order up on a given day according to what mood we think these wines are in and how they'll build and kind of excitement or complexity. I gotta tell you, this 2014 Cordy, there are a lot of wines that we can go very deep about pairings and complexity and tasting notes and all of these things, and there are certain wines that you simply take your first sip and your brain just kind of goes, I could just sit on my porch right now and mm. just kill this bottle. It is just absolutely well balanced, easy drinking. It's not over the top spicy. It's not super boozy. It is not oak driven. This yeah. is just a simply gorgeous vineyard driven glass of red wine. That uh... I agree. That uh, comes from what 83, 84 year old vines, yeah. dry farms from the beginning. They come in convenient 12 bottle carrying cases. <laughs> <laughs> Which, not to limit you, you can always order more. Um, but I think from an experimental standpoint, I think it's fun to, to think about bringing all three vineyards into the house and bringing you know, friends together as long as you're six feet apart. <laughs> and as a lot of us have learned the Zoom and Facebook Live and all these different things, you can still taste wine together. I've, I've had two happy hours already in the last week and have another one tomorrow night. And it's so much fun to reconnect with people that you don't get to talk yeah, to often. It, it's been cool through the, the wine club sometimes to see people logging on going, I just opened the club shipment and they're logging on to each other going, me too, like yeah. what are you cooking with that tonight? And, so it, it's, the, it's the convivial nature of it as a beverage, I think, that'll always kind of come full circle. And uh, Ray, Ray, Nancy, you know, the originators here at Elise, their relationships with these growers and their ability to keep encouraging these families to grow these ancient vines at, at 85 years old um, is one of the blessings of us kind of stepping in and taking this winery over years ago. Um, for those of you that have been under a rock for years, yeah, Elise changed hands over the years, and uh, uh, we, uh, Josh People, Cheryl Foyle, new ownership here at Elise, we have been blessed by taking over a legacy winery and then being able to pick up that baton and run with it for the next generation. So it's fun to kind of uh, experience the wines from the older vintages, and then as we start releasing the 2018s, to see the progression and, and how we've kind of embraced that historical nature and, and moving forward. Um, well said. So let's wrap up as much as we're enjoying this wine. Let's wrap up the Cordy Ranch. Um, and one little tidbit I can give about the Cordy Ranch is the oldest bottle of Cordy Ranch Zin that I've seen and tasted is 2002. Uh, and earlier Christopher was talking about how 
well-made Zinfandel at lower alcohol levels ages really well. And those Zinfandels, especially in Magnum, are gorgeous right now. Um, so that's the Cordy Ranch 2014. We're going to move on to, what do you think, Christopher? Well, we get to work with this other historical property that's kind of fun called Morisoli. Uh, this is really the vineyard that built this winery where Ray and Nancy uh, Course and the original owners uh, lived in the middle of this vineyard in Rutherford. Um, once again, we are at 9,500 year old vines. Thank you, Morisoli family, yeah. for the legacy and keeping those vines of that historical nature uh, planted. Um, I got a name I want to throw out there for you guys. Um, any of you at home, you know, that are faster on the internet than I am, look up a name called Frederick McCondry. This name has no bearing gravity-wise uh, in the wine business until you look it up. He was the first hothouse grower of Zinfandel on the east coast of bring it to California in the mid-1800s. Oh. Again, because they were going to try to cultivate it as a, as a table grape. And the only reason that you even see some of that Zinfandel being offered internationally was because the Austrians had started building seed banks and plant uh, banks way back in the day in the 1700s to start thinking about bringing exotics in because everybody in those days wanted greenhouses, right? Look at the English. The weather's horrible. Nothing's going to grow, but you put it inside of a glass building, you know? That's a good point. So it was interesting to see the Austrians start building these early agricultural kind of preservation uh, museums. Uh, to this day, uh, Vienna, I think, still has some of the most elaborate seed sort of preservation and, and agriculturally preservation hothouses going. And uh, and so they originally had it, a, it was it was easy to grow. Once again, Zinfandel rears, it's, it's uh, uh, easy to work with uh, kind of personality. Um, more solely for us is kind of like winning the lottery in the wine world. Um, given the chance to work with certain sites there's a lot of competition these days, not amongst wineries. And that's one of the weirdest attitudes we'll keep talking about as this show progresses. The lack of competition between wineries and the celebration of each other's wines. Um, More so is one of these sites that you really feel blessed by the fact that we're not making any more Napa Valley. This is it. This is We've already declared the boundaries of Napa. So the only competition out there these days is acquisition of those relationships and being able to get the grapes from those sites. In our relationship with the Morisoli family, generation after generation of just exceptional farming, uh, has been an opposite pressure in the wine business for us. <laughs> like, it's one thing to be able to make a great wine. It's another thing for fruit to show up and you're like, man, that's perfect. Don't screw this up. You know, and so there's almost a, an interesting reverse uh, pressure when the grower uh, gets to a certain skill level, I think. Um, but there's an interplay. Winemakers learn from growers, grower, growers learn from winemakers. Once those two are kind of meeting on the same level of creativity, that's what I think where the great wines of the world happen, regardless of the, uh, the grape involved. Um, more solely for me has always been, the, as, a, as a table side psalm for 20 years, more solely for me has always been one of those vineyards where I can take my Cabernet drinker and go, I'm going to introduce you to Zinfandel today, and more solely has a texture and a weight mm -hmm. and a kind of aromatic profile to it for me that always made me not resist it as much as other varietals as a Cabernet drinker. I agree. There's depth and complexity to it year in, year out, and just like any vineyard anywhere is not going to be the same vintage to vintage, but the the commonalities of this particular site, which I don't know if you can see this picture back here, but it's uh, the remaining, as far as I know, two acres of the Old Vines Inn that's left on the Morisoli Vineyard, and Elise has had exclusive rights to that since 1988. Um, so this is the corner. You're at Grand High School, represent. Oh, yeah, thank nice. you. Yeah. Those of you that don't already high school back in Albuquerque, New Mexico, good talk. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you were quite the volleyball player. Hey, right you know, man. 36 inch vertical. I mean, luckily the, the bar cuts off at this. Oh, whoops, getting a little. It's not more like centimeters than it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's 36 centimeter vertical now. But you can see just the history growing on these old vines ends, and that that just it lends itself to a story in a bottle and a story in a vineyard every year, and we're. We're grateful to be able to continue that legacy here with Elise Winery. I think sometimes there can be, and this is for you, Russell, uh, there can be too much focus on the winemaking. 
Um, I think sometimes there's an illusion that winemaking is taking raw ingredients like a chef and creating a world famous Michelin, you know, dish. Back to the reference to Alice Waters and Chez Panisse. You know, she was notorious for serving courses where it was a single vegetable or a single piece of fruit on a plate. She goes, there is nothing I can do to that perfection as a chef that would make me feel good. I want you to taste how perfect that ingredient was grown by that farmer. Yeah. And to some degree, when you're making these smaller production wines, there is a little less focus on manipulation and more preservation. There's a whole different yeah. approach to those kind of wines. And I think that uh, to piggyback on that thought, that's kudos to Ray because that was his whole focus, is focus on the single vineyards, put it on a pedestal, and let that wine show off the farmer, the site, the terroir, um, which is becoming cliche in the wine business, but it's so true. There's a reason that the French came up with a term for it. Um, and Ray is a genius at it. He was not big on manipulation. And when I taste this wine, and with the Cordy Ranch, but definitely I focused on the acidity of this wine, the tannins aren't as big as you would get from other varieties, but the acidity is beautiful and refreshing and mouth-watering, uh, even though there's, there is texture, depth, and complexity. So to have all of that in one wine for $45 retail is like kind of the biggest no-brainer. Yeah, the biggest no-brainer. I hate when people say that, because I'm like, <laughs> so I should be smarter. That's what it feels like to me, man. I'm like, I should be keeping up. You know, like, what is that? You'll notice I vote with my palate. Um, the cordy, I can keep the complexity and all that, but more solely, man, I just, I just, like every glass of it I drink, I'm like, I can't wait for the next one. There's something about, it's almost like eating one of those spicy bowls of soup and like the hotter it gets, the more you have to eat the soup to cool the burn and then the hotter it gets, you know, there's this weird <laughs> The thing. nose is running, but you don't want to stop. Yeah, there's the, yeah, like an infinity effect to that. And, and more solely for me is every glass I drink, I'm like, I cannot wait to get to that next one. And, you know, yeah. Cheers to the Mor Morisoli family. Thank Bravo. you for working with us and alongside us all these years. Um, yeah, on our on our future episodes, when we start doing verticals, we'll have to uh, show you pictures of uh, of currently Dad Gary sitting next to his old work truck, and oh, knowing yeah. that the family had sold a lot of grapes, they had had financially really secured the future of the family, but they all still drive just farmer trucks, man. Like. Just, just the, the nature of the humbleness, and I think the echo of Napa from a farming standpoint um, is, is something that I think as a wine drinker, the more you appreciate the fact that it is the farmer. And you come to see us in Napa, and you come to the wineries, and I think the first reaction we get from a lot of travelers is, oh my God, this is a farming community. Yeah. Like they really understand that this is a, this is a tractor backbreaking, you know, farming uh, endeavor. And the, the blessing, again, we have as a winery is when we see these farmers, smiles on their face, dropping grapes off to us at harvest, going, you get to go to these you know, guys and gals. Like, you get to go to one of the coolest groups of people to get made into wine this year. That whole kind of encouragement and vibe uh, from front to back is when we consider success at different levels. You know, like that to me is one of those success moments where I'm like, man, we, we rock. Also, again, to piggyback, uh, when I was national sales of a prior winery, it was so fun to be able to show up in jeans and a collared shirt. It doesn't have to be tucked in because that's a little more dressy than the owners of most wineries show up. So if you're in New York, they don't expect you to be in a suit and tie because that's not what this area is all about. It is we are working me, maybe not technically, doing, the, uh, <laughs> doing out in the vineyard stuff, but I have before, and I've done a million punch downs. Um, so we are, we are not afraid to get our hands dirty, um, whether we are on the sales side, the back of the house side of um, managing wine clubs or whatever, it is a total team effort when that time comes. For you Michelin diners, you're welcome. We've done away with the jacket and tie in all Michelin restaurants, you know, just relax and have fun. That's the thing about Napa is sometimes I think we are in our bubble and we can be accused sometimes of ostrich in the sand a bit but there's also a duty we feel in napa to let you remove yourself from the world um, and drinking a good glass of wine it's a really for those of you that have had these moments there's a thing where you're absorbing sunshine and effort and the rest of your world for that moment you're drinking that glass of wine that's all that's going on in your world and that's a good release right now it's really the relaxation nature of what it is 
And that moment of captured sunshine, that moment of winemaking, I think, is what we're all kind of enjoying about it right now. Um, and so there is a, a bubble approach here to Napa where once you're in our world, you know, eat when you're hungry, sleep when you're tired, drink when you're thirsty, go for a run, go for a bike ride. We only get 300 perfect days of weather a year, so you have to enjoy them while they last. Yes, Colorado um, will brag about more, but I'm pretty sure we have them. Um, yeah, it's really weird. You know, like yesterday, super blue skies, puffy cloud, it rained for two seconds in St. Helena, right? Yeah. You know, um, my daughters have been going around the neighborhood and they stand on the curb and they are the dog walkers in, in St. Helena right now. So they're walking everybody's dogs for them because people are getting weird and start crazy out there. Yeah. Um, and uh, it has been interesting in that as isolated as we currently are, it has brought a lot of communities together. It's a really interesting dichotomy right now of how that separation has created a little togetherness. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our world, nothing brings people together better. And we're very fortunate to be living in the age of technology so we can do these kind of things. Or like I said, like the, the Zoom happy hour tastings with 20 different people all over the country or the planet being oh. able to come together. And people are taking advantage of it, and I know it's only going to grow. And uh, um, we found a bottle of wine on our uh, on a picnic table in, in our driveway this morning, and it was from one of the neighbors um, that works at Duckhorn, and it said "Duck and Cover" on the label. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love our community. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's nice. Also, as serious as this all is, to have a a serious but sense of humor about it, because laughter does make things a little easier. And no, we are all in this together. So. Um, speaking of which, let's drink this together and uh, oh. talk about what we're tasting. So we used to refer to this in the tasting room as the Hatfields and the McCoys. So the infamous rivalry between two cultures. Honestly, mm. the, the, the historical nature of Napa Sonoma being rival appellations is absolutely complete BS. Um, we celebrate each other's wines left and right because of terroir, because of the nature of Sonoma championing grapes that grow better on their side of the hill than ours. Again, Zinfandel being one of the only bridging varietals. You're going to get great Zins from both sides of that uh, uh, my, the Mayakamas Mountain Range there. Dry Creek, if I, in my opinion, if you're going to show somebody new to Zinfandel, an absolutely Wikipedia definition, so to yeah. speak, of, of crowd, you know, uh, defining something. This is a California Zinfandel. You can make them more elite. You can spend a ton more money on vineyards and oak and create all these fabulous versions of this wine. You can go as simple and as light as you want to go in non-intrusion. This, to me, is a good, absolute benchmark California Zinfandel. I agree. Um, there's something about Sonoma for me that has a little more spice to it. There's a little bit more of that, what I call right. pepper. There's a little mm -hmm. bit more. And it's funny, the first time you get it in your head, it makes total sense, mustard seed. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things where you can picture cracking one of those mustard seeds when you're drinking a good Zen like this. And it's funny, one of the classical pairings, if you go to Sonoma, rural restaurants, not anything fancy, no tablecloths, you know, a lot of times there's phone numbers carved in these tables. <laughs> um, not yours anymore. <laughs> um, I noticed most of those are in your own handwriting, by the way. Um, but it was... The wild boar from the hills of Sonoma, the wild mustard, and Zinfandel. That was the classic mm. Sonoma, here's the local dish with a local wine. Um, and then for those people that don't like anything with hooves or smiles, <laughs> the, <laughs> the wild foraging, some of the mushroom oh, totally. uh, activity, especially the chanterelles and the morels and the hen of the woods and the trumpets out of the Sonoma Hills are some of the greatest parents for Zinfandel known to man. I like that. Um, for sure. Although you don't hear many people talking about going into the woods and killing a portobello and sleeping inside of it. Because the, <laughs> the, anyway. the mycelium <laughs> lives on. Uh, no, but getting into this wine, I think he hit, hit the nail on the head. This wood, Dry Creek, is one of the epicenters of Zinfandel in California. And really the name Zinfandel is about California because it's not grown anywhere else in the world. Elsewhere in the world, it's called by different names, and like he was saying, when you transport things, they take on a whole new character after being influenced by the terroir of the location that they're in. So, yeah, Dry Creek and Lodi, those are the two. And now there's some serious players in, in Lodi. Yeah. Uh, Turley has worked with a bunch of these old vineyards. Oh, and Dog now Town used to be one of my favorite Zins, man. Totally. I love that yeah. one. Yeah. Shout out to Tegan Pasalacqua, yeah. who is taking 
such good care of old vineyard sites and doing really well with them, which God, Mr. Story, oh my God, up in Amador, I mean, hundred and something year old. Well, yeah, I mean, and that just shows the the awareness of Ray Corison to be making these relationships with all these oh vineyards. God. This is hundred and oh, yeah. I'm just gonna say at least hundred and fifteen year old vines because yeah. I think some of them are older. Um, Let's all think but, about what we were doing one hundred and fifteen years ago. Yeah, yeah. I was praying for the right family. <laughs> I was a spirit. I had no My prayers <laughs> went answered. Thank you. For the most high. Yeah. Wine preserves you. We're both 120 years old. It's weird the way that works, man. You know, yeah. I think it's always funny when you look at, it's like looking at old family black and white photos down that hallway in the old house sometimes is Zinfandel. I mean, they're talking 6,000 years ago. They're finding remnants of Zinfandel being out there as a grape. That's what led it to, to being one of those original mother vines. Yeah. Um, and so there is an interesting mm -hmm. echo when you drink wines like this, especially Zinfandel, that make you think people have enjoyed this body and this nature of this wine as long as we've been, you know, not running around as nomads. I mean, this is right. one of the first cultivated things we ever did. This is post mead. Yeah. Yeah, and if you, this is somewhat of Sorry, a question. Sorry, I'm Viking, I'm all about the meat still. <laughs> uh, we, we, you know, conquer, pillage, anyone look it up. Yeah, it's a thing. Um, yes, I was a Cossack from San Diego State. I know about those pillagers. Um, but also a, a question that there is some contention about, um, where did wine originate? And the answer that I know most to be true is Georgia, the country, which is not far from Croatia. So it doesn't. It does make sense that Croatia was one of the first one making the largest grapes. acreage planted to grapes anywhere in the world. Still, right now, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, when you looked at the flags of the top ten wine growing nations, this Russian flag would show up back in the day, um, uh, before Georgia had their own flag. Um, <laughs> but that everybody's like, why is the Russian flag up there? It's like that's the state of Georgia. That was the absolute largest wine growing region, and some of the wines still to this day. The Georgian wines are delicious. They really are. They've got a lot of great, again, historical echo um, to them, for sure. So yeah, it's delicious. Yeah, it's really, it's really funny. The corte to me is sit on the porch and drink it. The morosoli is if you need to write a haiku, this is the one you drink before you start getting well poetic. Well said. This one makes me want to be in the kitchen the whole time. The Dry Creek has so many culinary kind of... Uh, uh, images to it where there's spice and my whole brain is going, what do I want to cook with this? What mm -hmm. do I want to play with with this? So it's interesting that you can kind of play with these. So instead of food and wine pairing, we often refer to it as mood and wine pairing. And yeah. so, um, it's often interesting that I'll pick a wine out of my cellar, not because of the vintage, not because of the nature of the grape, because of the mood that I'm in. And that's the wine I want to drink to kind of keep up with that. Yeah, and just with these Zinfandels, I mean, these are uh, 2014 vintage, uh, which six years old, Pretty fun that we have these vintages to work with, and we're gonna get into 10 year old Zinfandel, and then if we haven't overdone our time, 20 year old Zinfandel. Um, but even with a simple. Like, well, there's um, always time to drink. <laughs> well, for us, we'll I don't know if anybody time. wants to pay attention. Oh, no, they're, they're, they stopped uh, listening 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, at least they held on that long. Uh, so, what are we gonna get into next? Well, let's go. Well, you know, that, again, I, I think one of the. The craziest things for us as a group of wine drinkers is everything that we've ever really done in our 20 years in the business has been things that we found the vineyard, we made the wine, we, we put it through its infancy, we birthed it, we tasted it, we bottled it, we moved it on through its life. Um, Taking over a winery and going through their library uh -huh. is, is We're good at whoa, that. Oh man, it is. I still feel like Ray, I feel like I should call you every time going, Ray, <laughs> we're going to open the 2000 today. Is that okay? You know? like, like, I feel like I still have to ask permission. I mean, the pleasure for us to go through and with the kind of winemaking that was done here historically, the preservation nature of the so balance amazing. of these wines has really been uh, uh, an amazing. Uh, a, adventure for us. So today, keeping with the theme of Zinfandel, we thought we would do some leaps. So we're going to go backwards from 2014 to 2010, and then from 2010, we're going to leap back to 2000. So we're really going to to do some leaps of, you know, here's a quick four years going, 30 seconds on aging wine. What's the, what's the nature of aging? Why is this such a concept you know, I think as a beverage, here I am a regular schmo walking into a wine shop, 
and I grab a bottle off the shelf and somebody's always going to tell you when you're supposed to drink it. What is that? Uh, I, all right, so I wasn't ready for that question, but how I look at it is people that ask that question, there's two parts to it. One might be that they're worried that they're going to make a mistake by drinking it too early or too late. The, the fact is that all our palates are different. And if you've drunk enough wine over enough time, older wine is more of an acquired taste. Um, most of us like fruity, fresher wines, and the longer we drink wines, we get into the depth and complexities that older wines offer because the primary flavors you get out of younger wine is fruit, especially here in California. So the longer wine ages, the fruit mellows out and you start to get those secondary tertiary flavors. So I think it's a two part question, but also then, then there's the experienced wine drinkers will say, Hey, if you own a wine shop and you have older wine or you know, especially you were dealing with somebody as a restaurant or experienced wine buyers at a wine shop, you're asking that question to get their, uh, their little framework of their knowledge of that wine. And it's almost like critics. If you're listening to critic scores, listen to the ones that have palettes that are sim similar to yours. If somebody else has a palette very dissimilar, then don't worry about their scores. If you find out, oh, every time this guy or this woman rates something highly and I agree with it, great. Then you can match up palettes. But the thing is about wine is your palette never lies for you. And what me, might be right for me at five years is right for you at three. Did we stop grading too soon? Like, should I have, like, presented an email and gotten, like, a 96 grade on that email? <laughs> you know, like, is wine only the last region of score you get, you know? I would love to know that, like, if I drink a 100-point wine on a 94-point day, does that count still? Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> is everything. And that's why it's, it's good practice when buying a wine fridge, whatever capacity you think you need multiply by three and then where was i going with this oh the rule in buying is, wine it is good to buy three bottles of a wine because you can have one right away yes. depending on unless it's a really young wine that needs to be aged but then that allows you to taste it and see where it's at and you realize that it is time oh i love it actually why don't i drink another bottle and then realize that Oh, I might need to buy more before it's totally sold out. I got to tell you, this 2010, there is satisfaction. Is Bo down there? In wine drinking. Boom. This 2010 is absolutely delicious. Boom. Come here. Um, this has got fruit. This has got brightness. This has got mid palate satisfaction. This is absolutely hey delicious. Um, I'm a perfect example of I never would have experienced this wine in 2020. I would have drunk my 2010s. There's my man. There he is. He's ready for Zen. <laughs> what do you think about the 2000? All right, 2010. This is Bo, everybody. He is the person, or I'm sorry, the being that keeps us sane. If you go to the Elise website, he is listed as proprietor because it's Bo's Winery. We all just work here. Okay. Thank you, Bo. <laughs> and you are definitely getting heavier. I took all the strength I have. Luckily, I've been doing my 10 for 10. Actually, yeah. I haven't. I've been challenged. The, I haven't uh, done my 10 push-ups. Did you see the NFL guy working out at home? And he's got his, um, he's got his uh, what do you call it, Burmese Mountain Dog. And he's got this big puppy in his arms. And he's, he's doing, doing squats. squats. Nice. And my dog's like about 90 pounds. Genius. So this is, you know. Yeah, Bo, you're about 90, I'd say. He's like, that's not 80. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, you're a male. You won't take offense to that. But this is the thing about wine drinking is satisfaction, okay, is not a finite number. This is the, I, God, it's really in great shape. It's not a finite number. So here I am, a wine drinker going, the wine was harvested in this year it was made and produced and bottled in this year i am now drinking it in this year you might love it at this year you might love it at this year you might love it 10 years down the road you get to pick your period in history for that wine when you find your pleasure point there yep. is no like 
And that's what I think we're, we're really, I think as a generational wine drinkers, the one thing we contributed to this whole industry was dissolving the moment of perfection. And that everybody has their own moment. Mm -hmm. And the trick, and that's the three bottle buy trick sometimes mm -hmm. is, as time goes by and you develop your own sense of, of pleasure, when it comes to drinking certain wines, your brain can taste a wine going, this is gonna be perfect for me in five years. This is perfect for me today. I really wanna lay this wine down for 10 years. And watching wine drinkers come to visit us and going, when should I drink this? It's the yes. greatest question we get. Man. My, my answer always is, for me, I'd rather drink a wine too early than too late. Because too early, I still have the fruit and I still have the beauty of the wine. And then I can also notice by after a little pour, oh wait, maybe I should decant this because it hasn't fully opened up. But if you wait too late, you're getting the tertiary flavors, which can still be beautiful, but you're thinking back, darn, I should have drank this a year ago or two years ago. But at least if you drink it too early and you're lucky enough to have another bottle, you can say, okay, I'm going to wait a little bit before I open that next bottle. I have a quick question for you. Which yes. vineyard is the 2010? Great question. That is the Corti. So we started off with the 2014 Corte Ranch, and now we're doing the 2010. And actually, I'd say these are similar in flavors, just fruit mellowed out here, because I still get that caramel and a little there's leather. A, and just there's beautiful. an interesting integration. The oak I think has become... perfect time to drink oh, this wine. Oh, I seriously, I mean, it it's is... It's amazing. Um, I think as a... Um, one of the great moments, I guess, in a career um, is gorgeous. when you drink a wine, this is what I love about the restaurant world in general, is I can drink a wine. Um, and if there was a chef I could mention that I think echoes this is Ken Frank at Latoque. He will drink a wine, that's for you, chef, um, and his brain will go, I will create a dish Based on to that. keep up with that <clears throat> wine, that inspiration. And there are times you make a dish and your brain goes, now I have to go find the wine that wants to play with this dish. Yeah. So I always love that interplay between food and wine and especially this 2010 Cordy. Oh, yeah, it's rocking. This goodness. is as much as Christopher and I have peeled through that uh, cellar and even on his days off, I peel through it by myself. <laughs> so I feel like I've tasted more of these wines than he even has. But this is the first time me tasting this vintage of this vineyard, and uh, it is outstanding. Hopefully, we have some of it. So we, we, might, we will, let's put yeah, we yeah good. let's put together a twenty ten like <laughs> oh. uh, a show reference pack because I can tell you we tried the twenty ten Morisolis, Cabs, Morisolis, man, man that vintage. Ray, you did, re you, Jake, you guys knocked it out of the park in twenty ten, man. Yeah. Right? Was Mike here in 2010? Yeah, I don't think yep. yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Mike, that's where you and, and still in Sacramento and Amador these days? No, he's, isn't it Sassoon? Sassoon. Oh, yeah. Sassoon. Sorry, Mike. I yeah, it's a it really a respected over. vineyard that uh, one of the ex-associate winemakers is try. now running. Anybody Mike out Trotter. there? Good man. Good uh, people. Yeah, I have some friends doing their small little labels, getting great fruit from him. And the Jake is Jake Corson. Jake represents Jake and Franklin. They got their wines relaunched. and uh, Ray Jake. Ray Jake. Not to be confused with Ray Jake. Brandy's brother. Sorry. All right. Uh, so are we uh, moving on? I don't want to move on. I know. This, but I know. we need well, to because people are falling asleep. So uh, when you guys are, when the show is over, just, we'll have 2010. We'll put it out on the front of the winery. If you anybody locally want to drive by, we'll leave it out there for you so you can uh, have some. Wait, let daddy first. <laughs> Don't show your age. I was thinking Big Brother might be good. Oh. But that show, I don't think, is on the air anymore. Um, so now we are on to... Oh, that was weak. Oh, I know. Your backhand has never been your strong suit. I know. Suit. No, I'm, I, I tend to do a lot of English. I, have the full, <laughs> I can't get the roll over. Well, it's the shuffleboard. I will, board, I will slice the Jesus out of that backhand, man. You know? um, older wine. I think it's interesting sometimes when we have modern wine drinkers and we're trying to talk about older wine. I don't know that you can explain the nature of older wine. I think you have to experience it. And the word that's always going to be kicked around is what we consider achievement is the word balance. 
And I think it's the hardest word in the wine business because everybody's got a different concept of what that means. So now what we're doing here is this is a 2000 vintage. Mm. Um, and it's the Morisoli, right? Yeah. Like, I'm not, like, like I said, right. I'm not, yeah. Um, that is fantastic. Again, when you start talking about perfection of sight, I can make a very sound wine from a very well-grown vineyard that will not serve the test of time. It has to do with the spirit and the nature of that site, and that vineyard has that longevity luck factor, for lack of a you know better explanation. And these Morisolis, mm -hmm. the the history mm -hmm. of us going through the library of these wines and going back to the early late '80s, early '90s, going man, these things are still alive. They are. This is just one of the great sites in the wine world. This is our Latash, so to speak, in the in the Zen world um, for you. Obsessive Burgundy heads out. Well, and, and you talk about luck, and a lot of it is luck, but it, it could have been luck from the first generation of the Morisole, which is now spanning five generations. So, uh, and what we talk about sometimes with a different wine that we make, Nero Misto, which is a field blend, back in the 1850s to 1890s, they would plant a bunch of different varieties, really dark skin varieties, in the same vineyard and see what did best. So then a lot of times, there's no other way. varieties got pulled out. More Zinfandel was planted because it did so well, and this is we're dense. the beneficiaries of it. This oh, is rich. Yeah, this is the fruit deep, is dark, fruit and, and, right in the yeah. middle of this. Is a twenty-year-old Zinfandel out of oh, a seven fifty? Man, this is an outstanding shape. I and we also something uh, uh, credit to obviously the Morisolis, but Ray as well. They what they purchased this site where our winery is in ninety seven. Eighty seven. The the label started in 87, 97, but this site in 97. Right. So some of these wines have never moved. Basically, if it was a 95, which would have been bottled in 97, probably 96s have never moved from our cellar. Yeah. And so we go through our library to see what's tasting good. I mean, they all taste good, but what's really exceptional, and then be able to share that with our members. Um, and there are a lot of members that have definitely take advantage of Ray's amazing wines that will stand the test of time. And oh. this is living proof. Holy like we're both tasting that. We did not taste these, any of these wines no. before. We just Man. made sure they weren't corked, uh, which Ray has an amazing history with oh. non-corked wines. Also, can we get into how we open that bottle real sure. quick? All right, so here we're talking about older vintages. Now, how you get the cork out of your bottle. Okay, we don't want to overly geek out about a lot of things because wine drinking is supposed to be friendly and easy. But let's say you want to experience magic like this. These corks, okay, the decision making has so many forks in the road. Cork by its nature, trying to remove older cork from a bottle is where, as a beverage, wine can get slightly more complicated than screw cap, you know, pulling the stopper on good whiskey, that kind of thing. So when it comes to wine, the normal wine opener that we see, a uh, uh, corkscrew, okay, this is known as the waiter's friend, by the way, um, because of all the wine world, this is the only device that actually opens every single format of wine ever invented. Um, I don't see a lot of people using the, um, the I, I actually haven't seen an Osso for large formats. I've only seen an also with these prongs, okay? The only time I've ever seen this is for 750 milliliter size corks. Which is the same with magnums, correct? Or no? uh, for the most part, yes. But three liter, six liter. But yeah. I've never seen osos yeah. for these larger, yeah. you know, kind of... Uh, so this is the whole thing we're talking about here is, again, it looks like a really intimidating piece of, uh, of equipment. The whole idea here is when you take this and put it through a cork like this, the older corks are powder sometimes and they will disintegrate into your bottle and then you gotta, you know, we'll, on a future episode, I'll show you how to pour it through one of your uh, cotton masks. It's awesome. <laughs> um, N75s uh, work I'm great. I'm just gonna do it where you just pour it into your mouth directly, but the, let's, we'll save that for, yeah. yeah well, future. you have a natural filter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Older vintages like this 2000, we removed with something that looks like this. 
Um, and the whole What's nature of this is an ASO was the it's original. It's spelled A-H-S-O. Yeah, the first time somebody said, can I borrow your ASO? And I was like, what did you just call me? <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and so the whole nature of this is you're actually taking an older cord and you are compressing it between these two little, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, for lack of a word, filaments? I don't know, what do you, you know, tabs? No, no, you're the sorry, whole nature is not. you're going to do this wiggle where you get these little guys on the other side of those it. corks, like so. So now you've got these little grips that They're are holding clamps, that fragile almost. core clamp, better word, uh, together. And as you wiggle, if you try to push it straight down, it's never going to work. And, yeah, a lot of times those old bottles, they're greased up with wine, how, and it, you'll actually push the bottle. And some ways do it very well, but... Anybody that's ever built anything by hand, the shimmy. You know, you don't tighten all your bolts down at once. You shimmy and everything locks into place and you tighten down. So the whole thing is, now what you're able to do is, as you twist, this thing is compressed, all that fragile cork, and you pull the whole thing out at once, and now you get cork removed 100% without having uh, to put the cork screw in. The waiter's friend, now, again, I have seen... We like popping corks. The needles, where you put the needle in with the gas and it pops the cork out, is amazing. That's one of the greatest, like, easy ways to remove a cork. So, the biggest mistake people make with this bad boy right here is they don't understand the role of this little guy at the end. Man. So they think the whole idea is you put the cork in, and then they, you sit there and you try to pull the cork out of the bottle like this. So, as we finish today... We're going to show you the other method of opening a bottle. We're going to continue to drink all of these wines. And we are going to invite you to reach out to the Elise Winery at some point uh, and take these same wines that we tried today, get them into your house, start drinking them with yourself, with your friends. You know, I love this whole thing where you can drink a bottle. This is what happened in our neighborhood. And then this bottle showed up next to the other one that was already open because they poured it into a glass. They just put the bottle going, we had this amazing wine at dinner last night, you should have a glass out of this bottle. Right? Is that still safe? I still think it's safe. I'm so, sure. the whole point is, you put the corkscrew in, this little guy right here, the whole point is, he is now your lever. He sits on the edge of the bottle, and you pull him out, and that's for fresher, newer wine. And so, real quick, because we are wrapping up, but this device he just showed you is an also, but it is one of two parts of a Durand, which is specifically meant for older bottles. The corkscrew is longer than normal corkscrews. If you put it all the way down and then put the also in, now you have clamps on all four sides of the cork. And you don't have to be gentle wiggling it in. And you do this, and the cork comes out every time. So, bingo. Last comment? Uh, this has been a lot of fun, and I'm, I am super grateful that I got to try both of these wines. <laughs> I can't wait to finish. I can't believe that I have, haven't tried them before as much as we have scoured that. So I'll both see somebody, so yeah, we so might need to So all we ask up. is continue to watch the show. It's going to be a lot of fun doing this together. Continue to reach out as we'll put some of these Good wines boy, together Get for up. you. And remember, a bottle a day is all we ask. A piece. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.